Let's talk about metabolic health and five very easily accessible tests that you can use as a proxy to ascertain, to put your finger on the pulse of where you're currently at. I've included these objectives here just to give you a feel for what we're going to be delving into and in how it relates to, as you see here, metabolic syndrome. I'll be talking about each of the five facets that constitute it, the conventionally espoused targets that would warrant a diagnosis of metabolic syndrome. But I'll also be explaining my much more ambitious target that I think we should be opting for if our goal is to be optimal, not just to get above the tree line, but to see what the summit actually entails of the human experience in terms of maximizing our physiology. I've got videos throughout this to show you very practical tests that I conducted just today, this morning, just to better familiarize you with this process and make it as practical and accessible as possible. At the end, I'm going to be talking about how to maximize your metabolic flexibility with a very specific feeding strategy that I haven't heard talked about before. And then lastly, I just want to introduce you to my website, Alpha Actualization, where you can learn more. So if you're new to my channel and you've never seen my face before, my name is Jason and my background is in healthcare. I spent my 20s as a consultant pharmacist circulating the state of Maine here. This is me in my consulting attire out at a nursing home, just crossing the T's and dotting the I's of those aged care facilities and vetting for, for example, drug drug interactions. This was the year that I was diagnosed, 2009 with a rare, apparently incurable disease called eosinophilic esophagitis. I was only 15 years old at that time. And here are the results of an esophagogastroduodenoscopy. That's an upper endoscopy that I had done actually at the tail end of last year, 2023, just evidence of the reversal. And this is my personal transformation, which is what I'm very passionate about, self-actualization, getting the most juice out of the squeeze of this life and just paying forward to you some of the best information that I've personally encountered to make that happen. So let's talk about metabolic syndrome. And the reason this is important is because of the myriad conceivable consequences or complications rather of metabolic syndrome. And what do you notice about these here? Not the least that they span so far and wide, right? We have thousands, countless thousands of so-called diseases, which in my estimation are unnecessarily elaborate sequences of sounds that simply describe a conceivable set of symptoms that can arise, that can surface from one single underlying mechanism, which I would submit is oxidative stress, the body's response to which chronic inflammation. I mean, what does cardiovascular disease have to do with polycystic ovarian syndrome, dementia, NAF-LD, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, hypertension, cancer? On the surface, all of these so-called diseases, they seem like a world apart. They don't seem related in any way possible because we're so myopically fixated on the downstream symptomatology that can arise instead of the upstream etiology, the upstream causes. When we're talking about metabolic syndrome specifically in terms of how it's conventionally defined. It's based on these criteria here, having an elevated fasting blood sugar, having an elevated blood pressure, having excess visceral adiposity as evidenced by an appreciable waistline, elevated triglycerides, also known as hypertriglyceridemia, and then a low HDL cholesterol. And you can see here the respective ranges that then constitute metabolic syndrome. And if you have three or more of these, then that's when you're given a diagnosis. But as we'll see, as we delve into each of these individually, and I share my specific numbers with you, I'll be talking about what I feel constitutes optimality and why these standards here are just setting the bar abominably low, quite frankly. So moving along now to the first of these criteria that I wanted to delve into with you, waist circumference. And for men, having a waistline in excess of 40 inches, or if you're a female, in excess of 35 inches is the cutoff that then warrants this box being checked of the three or more that need to be checked for then being diagnosed with metabolic syndrome. Not only do I think you shouldn't check any of these boxes and you should be diagnosed if only one are checked, but I would also issue more rigorous standards as depicted 
by this chart here, and this is for men specifically. So for myself here as an example, I am five foot nine, and it's saying here that my ideal waistline would be 31.7 inches. I would be overweight in excess of 36 inches, and then in excess of 39, that would constitute obesity. So what I've included here is just a very practical video to give you a sense of how you can actually assess this for yourself. And you don't need any fancy device like what I'm using here, which I'll show you briefly, is a Renfo digital gauge. It's something that syncs with my Android app. You don't have to take it to that level. You can really take any sort of measuring tape like this, and you can really just measure this for yourself. You don't really need someone else to actually conduct this. But again, I've got this video here just to show you my specific process and what my result was this morning specifically. So you can see here, I've got the app, it's going to sync and in real time, it's going to be telling me how many inches I am currently at in terms of the tape in its current configuration. I'm going to put it around the narrowest point on my waistline. And then I'm going to breathe out, exhale comfortably. So without sucking in, I'm at 29 0.81. I'm just going to log that and it's again just going to sync with the Android app that I'm using. So hopefully that gives you an idea of one way that you could assess this for yourself. Again, you don't have to get fancy with it. Just a conventional old school battery free measuring tape is perfectly fine. Now the second criteria I wanted to talk to you about is blood pressure. And again, going along with the theme of exerting more rigorous standards I'm not particularly fond of having 140 over 90 being the disconcerting cutoff. I think if you're over 120 over 80, it's time to revisit the drawing board and really reassess because this occurs on a spectrum. You don't just wake up one morning with a blood pressure of 140 over 90. This is an insidious process that takes months to years to actually develop. And I think an ounce of prevention is truly worth a pound of cure. Now, just briefly, the 120 is the systolic number and the 80 millimeters of mercury is the diastolic. But I think the most practical takeaway here is just making sure that your systolic while at rest is no more than 120 and your diastolic no more than 80. I did include results from the Actia. This is an unnecessarily fancy and frankly inaccessible way of measuring this. You can use one of the Old school, they're called a SFIG momentometer, just a blood pressure device, or the next time you see your doctor, for example, for a regular checkup, one of the medical assistants, for example, can measure that for you. One thing just to be aware of though, is that when you do go into the doctor, you probably haven't been sitting down for five, 10, 15 minutes prior. So unfortunately you can get a lot of false elevations. And that's why I think, honestly, ideally, it's best to measure this at home in a more controlled, comfortable environment where you can sit down for a prolonged period of time prior to the measurement. So you can see based on 523 measurements that I had done via Actia, my average systolic over diastolic was 114 over 70. But I did want to include this video here just to make this more practical and show you the exact process that I employed this morning to have a reading performed. So you can see here, I'm just proceeding via the app, crossing the T's and dotting the I's, and it's just walking me through the steps, making sure that, for example, the blood pressure is in place once it is, and it's guided me through that process. I'm going to select that it's in place. It's going to have me get into a proper seated position. I'll be putting my palm down. The cuff will begin to inflate. And then it will give me my systolic over my diastolic reading. Prior to doing this, by the way, I had been seated for at least five minutes. And you can see here, 106 over 63 with a resting heart rate of 55. So that's just to give you an idea of what the process of ascertaining your blood pressure looks like, basically in a home setting. So the next criteria that I wanted to have a look at with you is high density lipoprotein, HDL, often referred to as your good cholesterol. And the truth is, is that there really is no such thing as bad cholesterol, so-called LDL. 
Not until and unless it becomes oxidized does it become injurious to the endothelium. And I'll do a future video all about that and breaking down cardiovascular disease in its most fundamental causative form. Now, what I've included here is some historic blood work that I've had done just to show you my HDL cholesterol also relative to my triglyceride level. So to constitute metabolic syndrome, at least in the literature, it's defined as having a HDL below 35 for a man and below 40 for a female. I would prefer to have you above 60 and even higher is better. This is something that I've personally struggled with historically because I tend to have very low cholesterol, which believe it or not, kind of concerns me because I don't want that to actually throttle, for example, my physiology in terms of my endocrine function, my testosterone production. This is largely genetically determined, actually, the fact that my LDL tends to be quite low, but then also my HDL, which I've had to work on historically to increase it. So back in April 2023, my HDL was 54, again, lower than I would like it to be, and my triglyceride level was 32. That's a very important ratio, and I would say to make sure that your triglyceride level is at most two times greater than your HDL, but ideally one to one, or you can see in my case, my HDL is greatly in excess of my triglyceride level. And more recently, towards the tail end of last year, I believe this was December, my HDL had gone up to 73, which I was very pleased about. That's been a long withstanding battle for me. And my triglyceride level was 54. So again, a very good ratio. I always want my HDL, frankly, to be higher than my triglycerides, one to one or better in favor of HDL. Moving along to the next parameter here, triglycerides. And again, going along with the theme of the less than ambitious targets, conventionally espoused being less than 150 milligrams per deciliter. I just think we can do a lot better than that. And I would never personally want to see a triple digit triglyceride level. I think that's horrifying, just the prospect of that. So if you can keep it to double digits or better, that's going to be the best level. And on the previous slide here, you saw my levels being 54 at one point in time and 32 another. So that's primarily, by the way, given rise to by a low sugar diet. So when people, for example, go on the carnivore diet, which is devoid of sugar and seed oils, and in effect, having ticked the most two important boxes for metabolic health, one thing to realize is that I recommend incorporating carbohydrates to replenish muscle glycogen, optimize your hormones, and not just get to the tree line, but again, get to the peak of physiology, get to the summit so you can see what's possible. And that's made possible, i.e. a high carbohydrate diet like what I'm following, because I don't have a lot of sugar, but rather I have a lot of starch, and that's how I'm able to keep my triglycerides so low. That's why my fasting glucose is so low, my A1C is low, my insulin, it's because I promote a low sugar diet, not a low carbohydrate diet. It's a very important distinction. So let's delve now into, as I said, fasting glucose, and you can see here the range for pre-diabetes being 101 to 125. And this is such an important point to bold italicize and underscore, which is that you don't just wake up one morning and are rendered a diabetic at this somewhat arbitrary 126 milligram per deciliter fasted glucose cutoff. This is not black and white, but rather infinitely many shades of gray. And it's a spectrum of infinite degrees of insulin resistance or sensitivity. You want to be as insulin sensitive as possible and ideally want a fasting glucose level, at least what I would recommend, less than 90. And circling back to proponents of keto and carnivore, this is something that due to the physiologic insulin resistance that they're going to run into invariably will result in their fasting glucose, frankly, being triple digits oftentimes in the low 100s or perhaps in the mid to high 90s. And the way that I'm able to circumnavigate that, I'll talk about at the end of the slideshow. It's a really powerful tactic that I think you could employ that would really help your metabolic flexibility. 
So the target that I like to shoot for here is less than 90 milligrams per deciliter. And I've got a video that I shot this morning showing you the exact process using my blood glucose monitor. And what I've included here too are the symptoms of hypoglycemia. Very, very important because you're gonna look at my fasting glucose here in millimoles per liter, that's 3.9. You multiply that by 18 to get the more conventional milligrams per deciliter. So in this case, that would be 70 milligrams per deciliter. And we'll see on the next slide, my fasting glucose this morning was even lower. It was actually 59 milligrams per deciliter, which would often elicit any one or more of these symptoms in an individual, assuming they're not insulin sensitive, which most people are not. Now to maximize your insulin sensitivity and your metabolic flexibility, you actually do want carbohydrates. It's just, again, you want the right kind, starch, not sugar. So less fructose, less sucrose, less galactose, and more starch. So this video here is one that I took this morning, and let's just have a look at this process. Again, just to give you a really practical sense of how to carry out this process. So what I'm doing here is including a new needle stick. So these are one-time use only. And you'll see I'm going to get this screwed into place, this hypodermic apparatus, so to speak. I'm gonna get it locked and loaded right there, just preloading the tension. I'm going to be grabbing a glucose strip right here, inserting that into the meter. And then now it's time for the blood draw. So I'm just going to be using my left pointer finger and I'm going to be using my right hand to facilitate this, to draw the blood. So I've done the stick. And now I'm just gently squeezing to get enough blood to actually fulfill the sample here. So I'm taking the meter. I've got the test strip already inserted and it's just waiting to read the blood. Five, four, three, to one, it'll take five seconds. And then you can see here 3.4 millimoles per liter, which I believe if you multiply by 18, it came out to 59.4, which again, most people are going to experience, honestly, profound hypoglycemia symptoms, but that's because the vast majority of our population is quite profoundly sick. They're quite profoundly insulin resistant. Now, this is a work of art. This is the best map that I could possibly afford you to help you better navigate life, level up, fix your physiology, optimize your endocrinology. These are the foods that completely recontextualized the way that I experienced life. Red meat, beef specifically. We've got full fat dairy products if you're lactose tolerant and effectively digest dairy. We've got free range eggs, beef liver, white rice, basmati specifically being the best. We've got pomegranate juice bought in glass, wild caught salmon, sweet potatoes, and wild blueberries. I truly believe that this constitutes the absolute pinnacle of human nutrition. And if that, if you make the majority of your diet comprised of these nine foods, you really cannot go wrong. But what I would dovetail these foods with is a very specific feeding strategy that I haven't often heard discussed, and it's too mad. Two meals a day, but maximally spaced. The key with a carbohydrate-containing diet, ideally north of 150 grams per day for men, is to eat infrequently. So I do two meals per day, maximally spaced. You don't have to be neurotic about eating every 12 hours. It's just spacing it as much as possible within the context of your day-to-day -day life. The reason that this strategy specifically fosters great metabolic flexibility is because you're not neglecting your carbohydrate intake like you would in a ketogenic state. For example, you're consuming carbohydrates and not just once a day. You definitely don't wanna do this in an OMAD fashion. You wanna be consuming at least two meals per day to really leverage this, but you're getting those carbohydrates infrequently spaced without snacking in between. So that way you can even achieve a light level nutritional ketosis in between meals, even though you're eating 
a lot of carbohydrates. And what this also allows you to do, for example, is have great satiety and little reliance on glucose if you aren't able to eat, for example, at your next scheduled time. So for example, if you're traveling and you don't want to be consuming processed junk food on the plane and in the airport, this allows you to easily forego that because you're used to fasting at least 10 hours in between meals. This is a really powerful strategy that I personally find it gives me great freedom and flexibility with my meal timing. And if you have a conventional job, for example, what I recommend doing is just not packing a lunch. I think you'll find this actually gives you a lot better mental focus and clarity throughout the day. You don't have to be digesting food around noon. You're going to be much more productive. And also it's going to save you time in terms of actually meal prepping to bring to work and then dealing with the dishes that are necessary, <laughs> necessary evil and byproduct of that process. So that's it for today, my friend. Lastly, I did just want to briefly mention alpha actualization. So this is my website and frankly, the greatest gift that I'm currently capable of affording you. These are streamlined articles that are the best distillation and dissemination of the best of the best that I've personally encountered on my self-actualization journey from going from a lightly autistic, INTJ, introverted, socially stifled robot to being a reasonably confident, successful with the opposite sex individual who just feels good, feels at ease with myself, comfortable in my own skin. I feel like I belong. I feel like no matter what room I walk in, there's open arms on the other side of that door, just ready to accept me. And I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to be alive. I'm so excited for the future. And I hope you are too. I love you very much, my friend. Drop a comment down below. Like and subscribe. <laughs> for more content like this. And as always, until next time, find your freedom. Peace.